speaker comes from another galaxy. Not <laughs> Our next speaker is Tom Weissmuller, uh, uh, scientist, climatologist, I believe you could call him that, uh, expert on the climate, and he has you know, been very courageous in, in fighting some of this climate uh, insanity and uh, has a few things to put on the record in this regard. And here he is. Hold on one second. He can't, we can't hear him yet, but we will in a minute. Okay. Uh, if everybody can hear me, just wave your hand. <laughs> hey, that works. Great. <laughs> All right, well, I made the mistake of uh, driving from Maine down to Virginia. What? <laughs> Much wiser had I stopped off in Boston and done this live. <laughs> Hung around for a day or two and then come down here. But anyway, it's behind me. Nothing I can do about it. I am going to try to uh, talk about sea level rise and CO2. Some of you may have heard this if you attended the Eurasia Convention. Uh, that was held in Boston last weekend, where I was part of the science track, and this was one of the presentations. I've added a couple of slides. But let me uh, first start with the premise, sea level rise and CO2. You've all heard that, my goodness, we have to do something about CO2, because the oceans are going to rise, well, rise and we're all going to get flooded. Is there a link between an increase in CO2 and a corresponding increase in the uh, in sea level, uh, and just, if one rises, does the other rise? If one falls, does the other fall? Well, let's try the next slide, and you'll see what the uh, future was predicted to be for New York City. Many people in Boston may think this is not such a bad thing. However, <laughs> uh, this is the uh, book jacket cover. The book by Heidi Cullen, who is, uh, I think, pretends to be a meteorologist. And she actually knows some stuff, but this is something that will not happen, cannot happen, not in your lifetime, not in the lifetime of any of your descendants. Uh, let me go to the next slide. The next slide uh, is now going to be talking about temperature and CO2. And I'll get to sea level in a minute. Now you're looking at a period that covers about 2,000 years. And CO2 runs across the center of that graphic at 280 parts per million for the last 2,000 years, except recently. Uh, and by the way, it's not just the last 2,000 years. This goes back almost 10,000 years, a very steady level of CO2 which all of a sudden in the 1800s began to rise. But notice in the meantime, uh, the medieval warm period, that's what MWP stands for, occurred. No budge at all in CO2, not, not up or down. And the same with the little ice age, a little blip there, I'm not so sure how accurate that is. But frankly, during the little ice age, temperatures on the world plunge and CO2 remains level. Then underneath that black arrow, that black arrow represents a subset. And that subset's going to be shown in the, in the next slide. But uh, hold on for a second. <clears throat> you notice that over the 2,000 year period, there's basically a 4.5% correlation between CO2 and temperature. Well, let's look at the next slide. The next slide actually comes straight out of the National Climate Assessment. This is the U.S. government's 800-page uh, uh, study on climate. Uh, a lot of fiction, but there's also some decent science in there. You have to be able to sort out one from the other. Now, this is occurring over a 135-year period. And you notice, even during that 135-year period, there's a place in the beginning, in the 1800s and early 1900s, where Temperatures drop even as CO2 is rising. So there's a, you know, basically a two-thirds correlation here. Past 1900, temperature goes up, CO2 rises. But again, correlation is not causation. Uh, again, and this is a, a small subset of, of the past. 
So let's take a look at sea levels now. If you go to the next slide, uh, we're looking at 20,000 years worth of sea level rise, basically from the end of the last ice age, when the great continental glaciers finally disappeared and exposed land to sunlight. When sunlight hits ice or cloud, it reflects off at wavelengths that CO2 does not intercept. So if you have most of the northern hemisphere under a blanket of ice and or cloud, you're not getting a lot of heat retained on the planet. But once land is exposed, which began happening around 20,000 years ago over North America and Asia, the temperature is able to increase, and the sea level increases. Why? Because that ice and snow are melting. And you notice there are a couple of spikes in there, some, some fairly rapid sea level rise. But most of the sea level rise occurs between those two red arrows you see on the bottom of the graphic over a 7,000 year period. By about 8,000 years ago, most of the continental glaciers are gone. There are no more mile-high and two-mile-high ice sheets to send into the ocean, and sea level levels off quite nicely. And it has stayed fairly level. Later on, you're going to see how, how level, even though CO2 in the last 130 uh, years or so has really rapidly increased. So how do, we, how do we measure sea level? Well, the best way is direct measurement. It's called tide gauges. And the next slide will show you an image of the tide gauge in Fort Point, New Hampshire. Uh, the tide gauge is actually anchored to the rock underneath. It is loosely attached to the pier, mainly because tide variation in this, in this part of the Gulf of Maine is fairly high, about nine feet uh, from low tide to high tide. But you take all those measurements together, average them, and you get a pretty good idea of what the uh, sea level is. The next slide shows you the inherent bias in tide gauge readings. Why? Because people put tide gauges where land is subsiding. Uh, in Norway, for example, Norway is, is rising at a very rapid rate because of the great weight of the ice that used to be on Norway is gone, has melted as a result of the end of the Ice Age. So Norway is rising. If you lived in Norway, you'd say, gee, look at that, the sea level is falling seven millimeters a year. <clears throat> that's a lot. But that's a very, very small part. They're not worried about it. They're not allowed tiny gauges in Norway. You go to Holland, uh, as a counterexample, when Holland is subsiding, so you have a lot of tide gauges in Holland. In fact, the oldest uh, tide gauge that we have been recorded is in Amsterdam Harbor. It was put in there in the 1600s. Uh, <clears throat> so let's go to the, the next slide, and you'll see why there are differences. Now, this is a, a fairly complex slide. Now, this is a slide that was put together by the great Axel Möhner. Axel Möhner is a, a world-famous Swedish oceanographer. Now what he's done is he's uh, shown you what uh, isostasy is. Uh, and isostasy is the um, balance between the mantle and weight that's placed on the mantle. So during the Ice Age, you see this huge chunk of ice over Norway pressing down. And the yellow part is the part that is being pressed into the mantle and okay, by contact into the asthenosphere underneath it which is uh, a little bit more flexible. And the blue strips on each side of the ice are where the, uh, this, the basically the, the forebody of the earth that is rising because it reacts, when pressing down on one part, the, uh, the earth will rise somewhere else. Now, the color is important in the next graphic. And the next graphic needs a lot of explanation. Now, uh, Murr did this one too. This shows the total differential uh, over a 20,000 year period over Norway and Sweden and the surrounding Baltic. Uh, anything in yellow shows a rise in land, a mountain building that occurred in Sweden 
the center part is almost 800 meters higher than it was 20,000 uh, years ago. The blue part is where you have subsidence. And uh, Murner constructed this graphic so that uh, one, the volume of the uh, rising, the yellow part, would be equal to the volume of the subsiding uh, territories. And underneath that, you're going to have to look hard. Uh, you'll see an uh, outline of the map of Europe. And the uh, maximum subsidence happens to occur over Holland. It's at the, about the 7 o'clock uh, part on that graphic. And it's 170 meters subsidence over the last 20,000 years. Uh, <clears throat> in between, where the, the yellow and the blue meet, is a zone that I call tectonically inert. If an area is tectonically inert, it's neither moving up nor moving down. Uh, what I was looking for is a tide gauge that equaled the last 135 years. And 135 years is the period that CO2 has skyrocketed by 38%. And the place I found happened to be in a little corner of the Baltic called Mecklenburg Bend. And it's a town of Wismer. And Wismer uh, is in Germany. It is basically tectonically inert, although in fact it is slightly in the blue, but it does match the period I'm interested in. So let's take a look at the next slide. And you'll see that we have a, a massive increase in CO2 over the last 135 years. In Whisper, which is tectonically inert, look at what's happened to the sea level. Do you see any acceleration at all in sea level rise? It is a linear, absolutely linear graphic. CO2 has skyrocketed and it has had no effect on a place on the earth where sea level is, excuse me, where land is neither rising nor falling. Now, a good example, a little bit more local for the people in, in this audience in Boston, is Portland, Maine. Now, Portland, Maine has a slight rise in sea level over the last 60 or 70 years. However, the sea level that was recorded at the end of 2014 was identical to the millimeter at the sea level in 1947. And that wasn't even the highest reading in 1947. But you live, you live in Boston and say, hey, I hear that sea level's rising here. Not really. Boston has uh, decided to build uh, 23 new skyscrapers uh, since 1960. And they're building it on what's called frangible bedrock. It's, it's, it's bedrock, but it's not that solid. So Boston, on the same body of water as the Gulf of Maine, happens to be sinking. Uh, and slightly sinking, so you are being told that sea level is rising in Boston. What's worse, you're being told it's rising because of CO2. It doesn't happen that way, folks. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, you know we had a big climate conference in Paris. And uh, the proposals uh, in Paris were to reduce CO2. Why they want to reduce CO2? So that sea level won't rise. Do you see any hope whatsoever? We don't even have an instrument that could detect a one or maximum even 2% reduction in CO2, but we can't even see a 38% increase. It just isn't going to happen. So I'll go to the next slide. The next slide answers the questions that I posed in the first one. Is there a cause and effect? And the answer is no. CO2 and sea level just are not linked. A lot of other things that link to it, sea level and CO2 aren't. And if, is there a way that one will increase or decrease the other? Absolutely not. So let's go to the next slide and look at the future of New York City. Uh, notice uh, the buildings, you can see them all. Not only that, we're using power wisely. <laughs> so uh, the buildings have a lot of light. And now I want to digress slightly. I hope everybody in this audience understands that CO2 and sea level just aren't linked. But what, 
What are some of the other things that influence uh, the climate? So if we go to the, uh, the next slide, and you'll see something which is quite telling, all right? Uh, this is a picture of the sun, and you're seeing three cycles of sunspot activity. And in sunspot activity, we're really, really talking about the amount of solar radiation that reaches the Earth. When sunspots are active, we get more. When it's inactive, we get, we get less. The sun heats the planet. The reason that when you fly over an ocean, it looks black is because the oceans are absorbing all that sunlight. The molecular density of the, of the oceans are far, far greater than, than air, about 800 to 1. So that heat is retained in the oceans. Now, it's also transferred to the atmosphere through evaporation. And there are a lot of meteorological phenomena, and I'll answer some questions on if you guys have them. But I want to look carefully at this graphic. You notice the peaks are declining. The, uh, you used to be able to set your calendar on the length of the cycles of the sunspots. It was 11 years, and the magnetic field of the sun would flip and reverse. North become south, and south become north. At the 22nd year interval, it would reflip and revert back to the original. So you had an 11 and 22 year methodical cycle uh, of the sun. And the intensity of the sunspots was relatively low. Now what's happened? For the last three cycles, you see a decided declining trend. Uh, but there's, there's more. On, on the very, very bottom of the graphic, you can see where uh, at the solar minimum, where the minimum sunspots are reached, in, in, in one case, the, uh, if I can enlarge this slide myself, in the 1985, 86 area, you actually have two places where there were no sunspots whatsoever. Uh, in 1997, there was one spot where the actual number of sunspots that was counted was zero. Uh, in the interval from uh, 2008 to 2010, we have five spots where there were no sunspots. And this, the, the length of the cycle has lengthened. The space between peaks has lengthened, and the space as the, the length of the down period. So that now we, it looks like we don't have a 11, 22 year cycle. We are very likely having a 13, 26 year cycle. The implications on climate are going to be profound. Do I know what they're going to be and what the intensity will be? I don't know. But the sun is undergoing an unusual act period of, let's say, inactivity and lengthening of the intervals. And this, this actually, I think I spoke to this group a couple months ago on the same topic. I hope many of you have heard of Willie Soon. Willie Soon is one of the world's leading experts on solar research. He's been working for Harvard Smithsonian for years as a researcher. His research is impeccable. It has not been challenged, and uh, he works awfully hard. I, I, I know him for a number of years. At the beginning of this last year, in February, uh, a coordinated attack on Willie's reputation began. The New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, Greenpeace, the uh, National Resource Defense Council, all within a week, started talking about Willie accepting oil money for his research. Now it turns out that Willie works for Harvest Smithsonian. He doesn't collect oil money or any money from anybody except Harvest Smithsonian. They're the only ones uh, who furnish him funds. They solicit the research, and once in a while he helps solicit the research. But they're the ones who get the money. They pay Willie maybe 40% of it, and they keep 60%. Not only that, Willie was under contract with them not to disclose the funding uh, sources of his research, even if he knew what they were. And many times he didn't even know what they were. Uh, why did they attack Willie? 
They didn't attack his research. They couldn't attack his research. He's the best in the world. But they had to attack Harvard Smithsonian and Woolley for, quote, accepting fossil fuel money. Now, the fact is, some oil companies uh, were giving Harvard Smithsonian uh, money for research, solar research, which Willie then accomplished and, and delivered to his, uh, his bosses, who in turn published it. Uh, again, the research and the conclusions were not attacked, could not be attacked, at least not successfully. And yet Willie was maligned. Why was Willie taken out of the equation? My own view is that what you see in that graphic began sinking into people, and they realized that the sun is, in fact, a huge uh, driver of climate, and its changes are going to have an impact on climate. And by taking Willie out and making him write letters and, quote, defend himself, uh, the publicity that you would get by having a world-recognized expert on the sun give testimony in front of Congress or whatever was just taken out. And I say this attack was coordinated. If you go back into the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Boston Globe, uh, Washington Post, you'll see they all, within a one week, all basically pounced on Willie. Uh, I've seen Willie a number of times since. He has weathered the storm beautifully. He is continuing his research. And he's still the best in the world. And we still have obvious impact on our climate from the sun. Where it goes, who knows? But the one thing you do know now is that CO2 and sea level just are not the limit. So that's the end of my presentation. If we can put the mics on, maybe I can hear some questions. Right now, I can't hear anything from you guys. So. Uh... Boston again, and and getting together with some of your some of your friends in in the institutions here who are not you know uh, who, who have not submitted to this fraud of CO2 causes sea level rise causes global warming and and having uh, a debate with some of the key people in you know Harvard in, at, at MIT. Who are who are promoting this obvious scientific fraud? And I was just sort of curious the other day. I I'm sure you know people, but I mean some of these guys uh, are getting uh, militant. Some of the people who are committed to truth. You know, there was one MIT professor. You probably know his name. It escapes me right now. Uh, but as soon as he got as soon as he got his uh, emeritus status, like within a week, he put out a bunch of articles in the media saying. Global, uh, global warming is a cult. The, 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 the most, most, uh, most people who uh, are promoting the CO2 global warming connection, it's, it's a cult-like belief. You know, this, came, this was a couple months ago, maybe you know who I'm referring to, but you know, what if, what if you, uh, next time you drive through Boston, or we can schedule something, come get together with some of these guys and debate some of these uh, fraudsters who are intentionally lying to people to push this, you know, sick political agenda to deny humans the right to develop. What do you think? What do you think? Well, first of all, you're probably referring to Dick Linson, professor at MIT, uh, who is very well known in, in, in the world, actually. Uh, he, is a, he is a professor emeritus. Uh, you can actually see uh, a debate between him and uh, Desler down in Texas. And uh, Dessler worked in the Clinton administration as a climate advisor. 
And he's off to deep end on the other side, on what I call the AGW side, it's anthropogenic global warming. And uh, they did debate each other, but it was like skewed lines. Each was talking about one thing that the other wasn't addressing. Uh, but it was done courteously. Uh, and that's, that's what was a little bit uh, nastier than it should have been. But you have John Kerry at uh, MIT also. And Kerry's, uh, Professor Kerry is on the other side. Uh, if I could get uh, Dick Linson and, uh, and Kerry to debate each other, I think I'd be seen as a hero. I'm not so sure I can pull that off. <laughs> you know, uh, Willie uh, lives in the area, but again, he's a solar expert. And uh, Willie does not pretend to be knowledgeable uh, to a great extent on meteorology and things like that, even though in fact he is, but his expertise is, is the sun. Uh, I'm, my background is meteorology, and I've been uh, doing this for almost 15, 20 years. I'm part of the uh, NASA TRCS group, and TRCS stands for the real climate stuff, all right, as opposed to like the real stuff we need to do to get into space. And uh, we're, in, we're based out of Houston, and each of us operates independently. For instance, what you saw today were the slides that I developed. I, yes, I used some Axel Murren slides and I used some uh, pictures that other people have provided, but I don't represent TRCS in that this is not their opinion. Uh, one of my colleagues, Hal Warren, uh, has become quite well known for uh, his uh, climate sensitivity studies and his research um, if you double CO2, what would the, imp uh, the impact of temperature be? Uh, so Hal and I will lecture sometimes, I'll talk about sea level, and he'll talk about uh, climate uh, effect of CO2, but neither of us believes that there is a runaway global warming uh, taking place. And in fact, if you look at the solar activity, you have some things to be concerned about from a research standpoint. In other words, uh, this is not designed to elicit uh, pains of panic in anybody in this audience. This is just, I'm pointing out where the research needs to be done. And I think the, the sun and, and solar activity is a very fruitful place to start. Uh, sorry for that long-winded answer, but I, obviously I, look, I live in Maine. I come through Boston quite often. Uh, I had four presentations at the Eurasia Science Track uh, in their convention in the Western Hotel this past week. And each of them was different. So uh, I have a lot of these slides, and, and the ones you're, you're seeing here, the ones you just saw, were part of a, uh, one of the presentations I gave there too. Uh, by the way, the little symbol at the top uh, is from the International uh, Symmetry Conference where I'll be speaking in Vienna, Austria in, uh, in July this year. And I was basically setting up slides for that and quickly I was asked by the Rouge group to bring them out and talk to you guys. So that's why you see the symbol there. This does not mean that the International Symmetry Foundation is endorsing anything I'm saying. All right, this is uh, what I'm saying. I'll, I'll be saying it at, at their uh, convention too. In fact, I'll be talking about the symmetry of ice ages. And that's a very clear, symmetrical, uh, covering over uh, over a million years of almost pure symmetry in our climate. And this is climate, and climate occurs over thousands of years. People like to look out the window and say, oh, it's snowing, that means climate is changing. Uh, sorry guys, that's called the weather. <laughs> Well, think about it. You said it would take a miracle to get a debate like that. Well, may maybe we could create one because we got to create it. We got to create a fight on this. So, thank you again. All right, I will thank try. You. I will try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was wondering. Hi, Tom. I was wondering if you could touch on how the climate data, the weather data itself. I mean, you touched on it with the question of land subsidence a little bit. But how the data itself on this is skewed in order to push the political line. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to repeat
repeat the question and speak into the mic. I really didn't hear it as well as I could have. Okay, I'm sorry. My question was on how the actual physical climate data that is used by, say, the United Nations, the International Panel on Climate Change, and other groups, how the actual data is manipulated, skewed, uh, distorted, and otherwise uh, manipulated in order to sell the lie about CO2 and global warming. Well, I'm going to address some of that. Uh, I, I should probably refer you to a website called What's Up With That? W-U-W-T. If you Google that, you will uh, get the most highly viewed, often viewed climate site in the world. And what Anthony Watts does, who runs it, is he, uh, he presents the data that you, you're talking about. In fact, many, many times shows how it has been altered, how it has been changed. Uh, how uh, he did a study, uh, a nationwide study, looking at thousands of uh, temperature recording devices and looking at their sighting. In other words, if they had built a uh, temperature, they call it a Stevens box, where they have standardized thermometers that are easily, I'm getting some feedback here, uh, that are uh, calibrated properly, then uh, they, they build the box and then they, they put a parking lot near them. Uh, we have some good examples where they actually have the venting of an air conditioner pointing at the box. <laughs> uh, at the airport in Baltimore, one of the boxes was put at the end of a runway. Did is uh, every day that uh, the jets uh, happen to take off on that particular runway, the maximum readings for the day went off through the roof. Uh, so Anthony's done a very good job in, in, in researching that. I think you can find that report online. Uh, so that that's one of the one of the things you have to deal with. The other is an adjustment in past temperatures, and that's been happening a lot. Uh, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York has, has done that, unfortunately. And I remember coming to Reykjavik, Iceland once, and speaking to one of the meteorologists there. And he was livid. Why is he livid? Because they had pulled down the uh, temperature that was recorded in Iceland in the 30s and boosted the recent readings so as to make it appear that there was a rising trend in temperature in Iceland. And the words that I received, now I'm an American, and he was livid at those GD Americans for tampering with the Iceland data because it was our data and you have no right to do that. Now it turns out that the thermometers they were using happened to be located on an Air Force base that was in, uh, near Reykjavik. So the Americans had a, quote, right to access the data. But he said they didn't have a right to manipulate it. Uh, there are other uh, websites, Steve Goddard run, runs one, uh, where he routinely shows the old temperature and the new temperature. And again, in many cases, the 1930s readings are all driven down and the temperatures in the 70s, 80s, and 90s are boosted up. <coughs> Excuse me. Recently, uh, we have entered what people call a pause. A pause means that there seems to be no real increase anymore in world temperatures for the last 18, 19 years. Uh, it means ba basically that the temperature is plateaued. The error bars in our temperature readings are measured in hundredths of a degree. It turns out that the error bars contain the highest temperature recorded in this plateau, in this 19-year plateau, five or six different times, meaning that any one of five or six of those years could be recorded as the highest year ever, uh, lowest year ever. 
because you know, on the plateau, you have to imagine uh, almost like you go out to the southwest and you see a mesa, a flat top. That's what the temperatures have been for the last 18 years. Measured by satellites, it's quite obvious. And they do temperature worldwide. Measuring through land-based thermometers is a little more problematical. And if you go to my website, I'm sorry, this is a really long answer, but uh, if you go to my website, which is colderside.com, there is a, a section called uh, Hadley 3 versus Hadley 4. You'll see the choices on the top. If you click on that, and you'll see the problems that they had in adjusting uh, temperatures. What they did is they added a, a, a whole bunch of Russian statements, uh, stations and, and some Canadian uh, stations. Uh, they had good records going back. But basically what was done is they added a whole batch of little urban heat islands all through the northern parts of Siberia and Russia. And uh, what the Goddard Institute for Space Studies did is they interpolated between them. So they had uh, one small little heat island in one village and another one a couple hundred miles away covering a uh, relatively unoccupied part of the Arctic. And, and they said, well, okay, we have the temperature here, we have the temperature there, let's average the two, and that'll be the temperature for the interval. Uh, it is not an accurate way of measuring temperature. The Hadley people were a little bit better. They just took those stations, but again, there's a bias. And when you look at the graphic on my website, you'll see how the uh, temperature band for the new reading of Hadley 4 basically is translated upward. Now, translation is a mathematical term. If you take a data set and you move it up or down, you are translating that data set. You actually, you'll find that you don't really change the data, but you're able to move it higher. And in moving it higher, you can claim, hey, this is the warmest year ever. Uh, and it is in the, in, the, in the translated data set. Remember, even the warmest year that they claimed, which was, was last year, and I think they're making some noise about this past year too, uh, there was a, only a 33% chance in the error bars that it was the warmest year ever, which means there's a 66% chance that it wasn't. So that's what, you're, what, what happens when you're dealing with a, a plateau region and you're trying to measure temperatures. So, uh, and again, the, the IPCC, the, the UN body that uh, is concerned about climate, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of scientists represented on it. And yet the final uh, summary for policymakers is not written by the scientists. It's written by the politicians who are put on the, on the tops of each of these panels. Uh, some scientists, and I think Richard Toll was one of them, just said, hey, I'm out of here. And you're changing my conclusions. And uh, <clears throat> do your thing, but not with me. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate. There's a political agenda involved. And the political agenda in, involves uh, taxing petrochemical companies, uh, making energy more expensive. Uh, and again, if you make energy more expensive and you tax the energy, guess what? Revenue is going to come to the government at a, at a faster, faster rate. And a lot of other hidden agendas involved too. And the, the laundry list is pretty long, folks. And I think you're familiar enough with the literature to figure it out. Uh, so anyway, let's stop that question and uh, see if we get this. There's a guy who's very patient standing up here. We're going to ask me a question. And I think I'll have to stop that. Um, I'm going to ask you about... Now, guy, talk into the, the mic. Real close to the mic. Can you turn it off? Right? Actually, just, uh, just speak loud and clear. Uh, the mic is dropping. I tried to bend it up. In the, in the, yeah, but then, then it's, I'm off the side of the cardio pattern here. Right, we'll I'll get in that. Like that. Get in that pad. Um, the chemtrails folks are spraying all kinds of stuff up there. Various people, Carnivan was the first guy who seemed to record a lot of it. Um, but some of it is supposedly just pushing sunlight away, but some of the other stuff has other sources and, and probably not healthy for humans. I'm not sure what they're doing, but it isn't just here in the United States, it's all over the place. And apparently the, the geoengineering folks, uh, a lot of them were uh, caught at a conference and asked about it, and they are ripping pests because the pH and everything that's happening to farmlands and things is, is messing up all kinds of agricultural things. And the geoengineering people have other agendas 
Do you have any idea what really is going on? And it's clearly going on in other countries too. All right, I can, <clears throat> I can answer part of that. And, uh, and actually, this is something I addressed at the Arusha conference because uh, there was a four day period after 911 when no planes flew in the air over this planet. They just were, uh, all, the, all the planes were grounded with no air traffic. And what happened in that four day period is that the temperature records that were kept showed higher highs and lower lows. You actually had a greater extreme in the temperature records from on both sides, high and low, than you had normally when thousands and thousands of planes flew in the air. I've got pictures taken from space that show the, uh, the contrails of planes uh, over the United States, over France, uh, they do have an effect. In fact, uh, what, they, what they do is they increase the albedo, and the albedo is reflectivity. They increase the albedo uh, of the planet to a sufficient degree so that some of that incoming solar energy is kicked back into space, so it doesn't heat the Earth that much which means the high temperatures aren't as high as they would be. On the other side, the bottom of the contrails end up sending heat back down to the Earth. They act like a CO2, like a greenhouse gas. Water vapor is a very strong, powerful greenhouse gas. And that means that the low temperatures aren't that low. So here you have an amelioration of temperature due to contrails. And then uh, the reason I, I talked about this at the Eurasia conference was that EPA was deciding they wanted to regulate CO2 emissions of jet planes. And the, the question I asked, my goodness, here you have something that humans are doing that lessens the temperature extremes, and EPA wants to figure out a way to monkey around with it. It's, it's, it's the wrong thing to do, and that was the conclusion uh, I made as far as the chemical composition of the contrails, uh, I have no evidence that some of those chemicals in there, and most of them are hydrocarbons, and quickly dissipating hydrocarbons, which means they dissipate into hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen uh, under, under sunlight. So I don't think there is a lot that is left in the atmosphere that we think is, uh, quote, very bad. Uh, that, that's all the information I have on the chemtrails, contrails. Uh, I, I am interested in the meteorological implications of the, the contrails, and I don't want EPA spending money regulating CO2 output when they should be looking at poisons, carcinogens, and other things entering our rivers and our air, which is what EPA's original job was, and not managing, monitoring, CO2, which is a harmless gas that happens to be good for plants mm -hmm. and uh, that we need on this planet because we like plants. I just want to say I was not referring to normal um, jet engine exhaust. I was talking about the other stuff that comes off other parts of the airplane's wing. If there are pictures online you can find of our huge planes with rows of tanks instead of seats inside and pumps and, and high beams and they're spraying all kinds of stuff out. There's occasionally a photograph you can find of where a plane landed with those valves turned on by mistake, and it's very obvious this is not normal stuff. And there's a, there's a Freedom of Information Act equivalent in, in England, and someone asked them, and the lady who answered said, I'm sorry, we have a standing policy of not answering things for ongoing research. That was all they got, but clearly they knew something the people who were being asked knew damn well what they were talking about, they just weren't going to tell you. Well, I guess my problem is I'm probably the wrong person to ask a question to because I don't have knowledge in this area. And, uh, you know, I, I try to keep my integrity intact. And then if I don't know an answer, I'll tell you, I just don't know. The things that I will answer are the things that I have some basic knowledge about. So I have to apologize now. I'm just the wrong guy to ask. Should I mail you 
DVDs? Hold on, hold on. Or should I just send you the URLs? Hold on. Okay, let's clean up. Should I send you DVDs or send you email you URLs or what? There's plenty of stuff out there by different people. I know. Oh, shit. Okay. Mr. Weissmore, can you yes. talk a little bit about the implications of the changing of the period? You talked about how it was an 11 and 11 year cycle uh, on, the, on the sunspots and how that's now changing to 13 and 26, and I wasn't quite clear. And maybe talk a little bit about how that sunspot activity is mediated into some climactic effect or weather effect here. Okay, I mean, there was a period in the uh, 1600s called the Mounder Minimum, where there were no sunspots viewed at all. Now, how do we know this? Uh, we know that the Chinese used to hire people, and whether it was the emperor who did it or, or who knows, that would look in a, uh, a, a thin saucer of water as the sun was setting so they could uh, attenuate some of the, the sunlight and try to count the sunspots. And they kept records of the sunspots. Wow. And, they, and, and they were doing this since the uh, 1100s. But again, for a 160-year uh, period, there were none. Then they came back. Uh, the minimum basically uh, was a time of no sunspots. So that stretching that you see beginning in that graphic if it, I don't know if it's still up there, because I can't, can't see it, but it's still there. The, the sunspots themselves are huge solar storms on the surface of the sun. They look dark, mainly because the sun is so bright, and the sunspot, in contrast, instead of being eight or 9,000 degrees in temperature, is four or 5,000 degrees in temperature, and it's obviously a lot lower now, in temperature, so it looks darker. But they... Uh, they are at the center of magnetic storms that send huge plumes of energy out. Now keep in mind, the sun is a sphere, all right? It is radiating in all directions. Uh, we occupy less than one millionth of the total energy that comes out of the sun, and yet it heats the whole planet, drives our climate, and is responsible for, for life here. Uh, those storms send particles to, to the Earth. We get uh, aurora borealis as a result, and those magnetic particles end up interacting with the Earth's magnetic field in the, high, in the northern and southern high latitudes. Uh, there was a time uh, when I was younger, uh, in the 1950s, when I'd fly over to Europe, and I always wanted to be on the left side of the airplane. Why? Because the sky was lit up with the aurora. And you can see it from the airplane uh, on our trips because the planes used to fly at night when they, when they went to Europe. And that happened to me also crossing the country, heading uh, from, uh, from east to west. If I had night flights, I'd want to sit on the right side of the airplane to see them over, over Canada. Uh, they do get down to Maine once in a while. I saw a stunning display uh, in the 1960s, uh, things that you just couldn't photograph. Um, so if you get a chance, let's say to go to Iceland or go into northern Canada, in a year of relatively high activity. And if you take a look at that graphic, we have just about passed the high activity, and it was only half as high as the, uh, the preceding uh, high spots before. So it's, uh, it's serious. It may mean the end of the aurora, too, uh, for a number of years. That doesn't supply a lot of energy to the Earth, but uh, it is a change that is worth doing research into, and I hope uh, that's been harvested from Sony and funds really soon to do even more of it. Is, is there a mechanism by which is Start there a again. mechanism? Start again. Turn the mic. Is, is there a mechanism by which that sunspot activity is understood to influence cloud cover or some other aspect that? that is correlated with temperature or weather on, on Earth? Well, um, there, are, there are some aspects where the sun really does affect it. And one of the ones I pointed out in, in the lecture, a longer one than this one, was that the satellites that measure sea level actually find that they, their orbits get degraded 
when uh, you do have a large amount of solar activity. Why? Because the Earth's atmosphere expands. And in expanding, these satellites don't fly into space. They fly in the upper, upper, upper reaches of the Earth's atmosphere. And if the atmosphere expands, the momentum of those, uh, those particles ends up slowing down the satellite, so the satellite drops. And lo and behold, it records higher sea level. We have a couple of those spikes in the satellite record in the early 1990s and around to, uh, 2011, uh, just when the sun uh, increased its activity again. So that's one effect. Uh, does it make charged particles more uh, evident? And, and do they serve as nuclei for, uh, for cloud condensation? Uh, the jury is out on that. You know, volcanoes do a much better job. And uh, there on Earth, we see the effects. And uh, we've actually had volcanoes that put up enough particulates in the atmosphere that the albedo of the planet has changed. And the uh, oceans have actually cooled and not released as much CO2 as they used to. Agua did that in the 1960s. Uh, Pinatubo almost did it in uh, 1991. Uh, and, and they do influence the climate much more than the sun. Now, gravitational effects of the sun affecting Earth, which may, may cause volcanoes, I don't know, that's a stretch. And it's in, in a field of science that really is beyond my own. Thank you.
Um, we'll get you the details. We're going to be having a chorus, a community chorus, uh, every Tuesday from 7 to 8.30. Um, you, learning to sing is very important in being a political uh, fighter. <laughs> and um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything more to say on that. You want to say anything? Well, uh, when you came in, you got these activity sheets, or if you didn't, then make sure you grab one and fill it out and turn it back in. It just, we want everybody to join us in these various events we have coming up, including the rally that Rachel brought up. So fill out your name, your email, everything, which ones you want to participate in, and you can hand it back to me. Thank you. <coughs> Are there any more questions? Do you have one more? Well, I just want to answer that. Okay. I said earlier, there was an earlier one to, to answer that there, there was a question about Tesla energy and zero point energy. We're not going to get any energy that way. Um, there is unfortunately a, we need a, a greater degree of scientific literacy overall to be able to consider and look at these things ourselves. Zero point energy, although it is a theoretically existent energy, um, let me give you an example. E equals mc squared says that there's a tremendous amount of energy in every piece of matter. Does that mean you can get it? No. There are certain transformations that change mass and in so doing release an amount of energy that corresponds to that. Nuclear reactions, if you, you know, in taking apart a nucleus and putting one together, if the resulting mass of the nucleons is less in that new state, you get energy out of it. Um, if you have antimatter, yeah, you can put a positron and a, um, an electron together, and you get energy coming out of it. Unless you can bring, unless there's a transformation that exists that brings you from one state to one of lower energy, whatever energy might be there on the books, on the record books, doesn't mean it's accessible to you. And that's the case with zero point energy, for example, where people can look it up and say, oh, there's a certain amount of energy in space, etc. Yes, it's true. Doesn't mean you can get it, and you can't. Um, the same. I mean, this, I just feel yeah, it's important to just address things and just let them go by. The same thing on on, um, on Tesla, who looked at transmitting energy wirelessly, but you're not gonna you're not gonna get a bunch of energy out of the atmosphere. The amount of electrical energy in the atmosphere isn't isn't a, a significant importance to us or accessible uh, in a similar way. The big antenna thing that he was working on that was that was for transmission, and a lot of things have been described to him that he either did say you didn't think or didn't do. Um, so I want to clear this up. is the common core stuff, which seems to be dumbing down our kids even more, and maybe similar to, and well, the, the, the hip, the same people behind that, as the common purpose thing in, in England, which there was a retired naval officer who had stumbled across it, and they were tripping him up after they were helping him for a while, and he, he's the one who blew the whistle on there big time, and then ongoing to this day, they're also um, tied to Council for Foreign Relations. Um, do you know much about it that you can talk about? Um. Yeah, it's evil. The, the, started with Bush, the No Child Left Behind, and, and Obama, and increased just like everything in these last 15 years have been just a fundamental breakdown. Started with Bush, Obama's no different. Obama deterred, or Bush deterred, that's what we call him. You know, Bush one, Bush two, and then Bush the third. <laughs> but it's much worse. And yeah, the education system is unbelievable. Yes, like we were talking about, Common Core is part of it. Um, but what we need is uh, uh, is a, a classical oriented education where people are learning to think, you know, where they're able to where where they're not just answering a question, but they're figuring out what questions to ask. And they can only do that if they actually study how to make a discovery, not just some you know, facts for a test or something like that, but actually studying Kepler, studying Leibniz, studying Plato, these great minds that, sh that gave us everything we see here today was all a product of the human mind. And instead of studying how those discoveries are made, we're, we're just 
taught some facts that do not give anyone the ability to make their own discovery, uh, to make to stop this progress as the intention. So I, I'd say that's what we have to do. We've actually put out on our website, our website has tons of material that people can study. Um, there's uh, policy sections on fusion energy, on energy flux density, on Kepler. We have a whole page on the basement, which Jason is part of, on science. It goes through Bernadsky. Bernadsky was an amazing genius who was, along with Einstein, uh, you know, uh, originating new ideas about space and time and how they work at the turn of the century, who also you know, should very much be studied, uh, could make new breakthroughs on the questions of Mars and, and the moon. Does life exist there? Does life exist other, other places? We should study for Nazi. We've got a lot on our website on that. So, I mean, start, that's, that's a great place to start. There's a person also up in Maine, well, for Tom is Paul Charlotte Thompson Nisserby. I don't know if you probably had her speak to you, but if you haven't, she would be an enormously good researcher. She's the lady who wrote The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America a little book years and years ago. And I won't go into all her history. But um, she has a deliberate dumbing down um, dot org website, but she also has American Deception, where her son Sam has put up, last time I looked, which was quite a while ago, it was 453 books that were suppressed books. You will generally not find them in libraries. They were written by members of the ruling elite, the, the good, you know, the scholar and the family or something, or the rest of them are the banksters. And they, they, siblings are the bad ones, and the good ones might write books about it, and then, oh my god, look what he wrote, and they suppress it. And um, a lot of those books are now, uh, they're all available there online. But she's a very articulate old lady who's sharp as a tack. She's just amazing. Have you had her before? No, no, we should well, contact her. She's, it, she's out there, big time, but they, they pretend she's not there. No one will talk about her on mainstream media, because if you go look, you'll find a lot. Good. And again, the, the subjective question, instead of, and next time you want to watch a conspiracy video on the, web, on the internet, get on our website and read one of the great translations from, from Kepler, from Bernadsky, or, or at least watch some of the scientific videos. It'll change your mind way more than finding out another way about how they screwed you. <laughs> I know, you know, it's important to know and, and not to ignore that. But, you know, the only way to actually really not be a subject of it is to develop, is to, is to think, is to not be asleep. And that takes work. And um, what we're doing in changing civilization takes work, too. And so it, yeah. We invite you to come into the office as much as you can to help make calls, do internet outreach, all, you know, there's many things that, um, that we can do immediately. Rachel? Um, yes. There's another person that's been very involved in um, education, John Taylor Gatto. And he's written many things. He's written a lot on the subject of dumbing down there. Hmm. Daughter? John Taylor Dahl. Okay. Um, also, I just want to say, I know, heart and soul, that um, energy is everywhere. In fact, we're not really solid, we just look solid. So I'm pretty sure there's probably ways to access energy besides nuclear energy. Sure. Do you want to say something? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? I'd say like a curler. Um, what's his name? First name? Wolfgang. Wolfgang Perler talked, talked about that. He said, yeah, you know, electrons, there's, there's a lot of space between the electrons orbiting. But, he said, they still act as a field. So even though there's not physical, you know, uh, it's not physically filled in, uh, the, the electron moving around the nucleus, there is, there is in a sense, a, a field of action, which is a self-contained unit, and which is organized around, you know, the, the biological process that it's in or something like that. So it's not, you know, people use this to say, oh, there's randomness, nothing exists. No, there are, there is structure to the universe, but it's, it's actually around principles, not around something else. Okay, just for record, we do internally, um, what do they call it, transmutation? So, and that's never mentioned in school, that you can read about it by legitimate scientists. So, I'm not sure that we know every possibility. And for instance, in, um, tra in biological trans 
transmutation, I believe I understand that silicon be, can be changed into uh, into um, calcium. So is that their decay? Or? Well, no, I mean, there's, I mean, I'm yeah, but there definitely is. We definitely don't know everything about the nucleus, and you know, there's a lot of work done on what are called low, low energy nuclear reactions. In the past, people may have heard about cold fusion. Um, low energy nuclear reactions is a more general term because they're not all fusion. And so people are working on a number of different you know, setups um, that by having nuclear transformations are able to generate energy. There has been, I think, evidence definitely worth considering that there is transmutation that's not explained. Um, inside, yeah, in the biological context. Louis Kevron is one of the guys who did a lot of work on that some decades ago. It should be followed up, and I think that some of the, the low energy nuclear reaction people are actually doing real experiments on this, getting the funding, making it happen, and that should be encouraged. Yeah. And really, the most fundamental force in the universe is human creativity and the human mind, and the human intention. And that's and we are here as part of a social process. We're all, you're born in a hospital, you're born into a society, like it or not, you know, you are a part of this process. And, um, and that's, that's the fundamental, that's the highest principle, is how, how are you actually advancing that, that process? How are you fulfilling your role as, as, a, as a person? Um, so I think it'd be good to just break up. We actually do have um, snacks and stuff to have reception so we can just talk and um, take people's questions informally and tell um, what else we're doing and, and things like that, unless there's any other questions. Oh, we have one more song. Let's have the chorus up here. Strong. 